All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roberta Braga. I'm the Associate Director at the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center here at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to start by thanking everyone for joining us today for what I know is going to be an incredibly timely conversation on domestic disinformation in the context of COVID-19 in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, this event is a part of the 360 virtual series of online discussions hosted by the DFR Lab, our partners for this event. And it brings together experts, decision makers in our global community of digital Sherlock's for a series of interactive discussions on some of the most pressing challenges uh, of our time related to disinformation and misinformation. And as we all know, uh, today's conversation will be focused on COVID among, among other topics, but this pandemic is one that has really shaken up Latin America as a region. And it's primarily impacted two of its largest countries, Brazil and Mexico, um, which both have been uniquely affected by this. Um, as of Friday in Brazil, for example, we've seen around 53,000 confirmed cases and over 3,600 deaths from COVID-19. And in Mexico, that number was ranging around 12,000 confirmed cases and over 1,000 deaths. And amid this pandemic, which has brought with it an infodemic, We've also seen the rapid spread of disinformation, misinformation, and false narratives, uh, both with and without the intent to deceive. Um, this is the first global health crisis that's happened in the age of social media and in countries like Brazil and Mexico, where conversations on online tend to be especially hyper-polarized. Um, there's a need to create an atmosphere of confidence and reliability, but although fact checkers, media, and civil society have mobilized to counter the spread of disinformation, um, we've seen that it continues to destabilize and affect the efforts to address the, the pandemic in both countries. Um, and that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at how the spread of disinformation and misinformation about this pandemic is impacting citizens' responses to the crisis. We're going to discuss how government, media, and civil society can do more together to jointly um, tackle this issue. Um, and to do that, I'm very happy to introduce our expert speakers. Before I do, very quickly, I just want to remind everyone that the hashtag for today's event is hashtag 360 virtual. And feel free to please engage with us on Twitter, the Adrian Arch Latin America Center, and DFR Lab. And for those of you that are connected through Zoom specifically, you can feel free to submit your questions directly into the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be taking some questions as the conversation develops, but also some at the end. Um, and with that, then, I'd like to get started introducing first Marco Rubier, Rudiger, excuse me, Marco Aurelio Rudiger is director of the Department of Public Policy Analysis, uh, better known as DAPI, at Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio de Janeiro and one of our key partners. There he leads a team of economists, sociologists, political scientists, and policy analysts on research that is focused heavily on innovation, data transparency, social networks, and a democracy and public security. So all very relevant themes for today's conversation. Um, I'm also happy to introduce Dr. Sage Savage. She's a research professor in computer science, looking at civic technology to transform work and political disinformation at NAM University of Mexico. She is also director of the Human Computer Interaction Lab at West Virginia University, where she studies how collective action is organized and works to build improved democracies with better access to jobs um, and social change. Uh, on the DFR Lab side, I'd like to introduce Luisa Bandeira. She's research uh, assistant and editorial assistant for Latin America with the Digital Forensic Research Lab, where she's leading their work on Brazil. Um, she is a multimedia journalist by training with over a decade's experience where she worked at BBC World Service in London, as well as with some of the leading um, media outlets in Brazil, including Folha de São Paulo and Nexo. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce uh, another one of the DFR Lab's expert researchers, Esteban Ponce de Leon. Uh, he is research assistant focusing on Mexico and Colombia at the DFR Lab. Um, he is also a data scientist um, in background, and he's focused a lot on machine learning, 
artificial intelligence, data journalism, and digital research uh, as a whole. He previously was at Fundación Ideas para la Paz, a think tank based in Colombia. So with that, I'd like to get started. Thank you again to our panelists for joining us. I'm going to pose the first question to Luisa. Uh, Luisa, I know that disinformation, misinformation about COVID, like we mentioned, they've really spread at an alarming rate uh, in Brazil specifically. And you focused a lot on that, on exposing and explaining that disinformation over the past few weeks. Um, what are, can you tell us what the main false or misleading narratives have been about COVID-19 spreading in Brazil right now? Sure. Thank you, Roberta, for the question. Thank you for good afternoon. And thank you, everyone, for joining us in this conversation. So before talking about narratives, I would like to uh, explain a little bit about the political context in Brazil right now because I think Marco can definitely help me and I think this is gonna be important for our conversation. So Brazil is in the middle of a political crisis and this is uh, very connected to the government's response. Uh, Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro, Brazil's president is one of the few world leaders who is still uh, downplaying the risks of the epidemic, of the pandemic. And uh, all the time he talks about the economy, that the economy is gonna be hurt uh, and uh, the reaction to the pandemic might uh, harm Brazil's economy more than the virus would do itself. And then um, because of that, uh, he got into a conflict with the health minister and the health minister was fired last week. Uh, the health minister was um, advocating for social isolation, isolation and more harsh measures against uh, the pandemic. And that, that was like went against what Bolsonaro believed. And uh, also last week, in the end of last week, we had uh, the Minister of Justice, uh, Sergio Moro, who was, was very important in the government. He was like the uh, symbol of the anti-corruption fight in Brazil. He resigned and that um, I can explain this later, but it's also uh, can possibly be related to disinformation and misinformation. So you have two important ministers out at this moment and amid the pandemic, and then you have uh, all the narratives that are related to this pandemic are connected somehow to the response that is coming from the government. So the main narrative that we see is trying to downplay the, the pandemic and trying to downplay the, the, the dangers of the virus of uh, COVID. And what we see is that uh, there are many like um, WhatsApp chains that we call WhatsApp messages saying that hospitals are not uh, not full, that there are no patients, that they are empty. So this is all something that is coming from the media, uh, fear mongering coming from the media. You have many people talking about possible ways to cure um, COVID with the debate about uh, the same one that happened in the U.S. about chloroquine. And then uh, you have many attacks on those that are trying to say that the virus is dangerous, that we have to take measures. One of the things that I think is very interesting is how uh, this narrative is not only being pushed via wrong information, it's not only misinformation or disinformation, but you can also create and you can also push this narrative uh, with messages that are true. So what I did in my research, I was interested in knowing uh, which were the, the stories that were getting more engagement in social media, what was being shared, liked, and getting many comments on Facebook. And then what I saw is that in Brazil, when you look at the top 10 uh, most engaged with stories, six are about how people were cured. So it's the first pa patient in Brazil that was cured. More than 100,000 uh, people cured in the world. So there are many things that are about that. And that can be, of course, is a sign that people are looking for uplifting stories. So they want to have hope and they want to believe uh, and they want to read the stories about cure. But also it's a sign of the political polarization because when you look at the groups, that are sharing these stories, pages and groups that are sharing these stories on Facebook, they are mostly uh, either religious groups, which are uh, part of Bolsonaro's political base, or groups that are connected to Bolsonaro and that are supporting Bolsonaro. And when we look at this in other countries, uh, I looked at, at uh, Spanish language, so for Latin America, and I looked at it in English, and the top 10 are not that much about cure. They, they, there are other topics in the US, for instance, the most read story, the most 
uh, engaged with story. It's about uh, the epidemic itself, why it happens, what we can do, how can we can flatten the curve. So you see that even this, even the engagement in Brazil, it's very, very connected to the political narrative that coronavirus it can be cured. It's not that uh, it's not that bad, and that we, we don't have to stop the economy to fight this virus. Thank you, Lou. I think we'll definitely go back to that in more detail throughout the conversation. And actually, I'll preface this by saying that anyone interested in Luisa's research on Brazil specifically should definitely check out the FR Labs Medium page where we're publishing these articles. Um, I'd like to pivot to Mexico uh, very quickly and pose the same question to Esteban. Would you just give us a sense of, of the main narratives and this information that is happening around COVID in Mexico specifically? Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Thank you, everyone, for joining for this virtual event. Uh, I think the most used narratives in Mexico are spreading through WhatsApp. I think WhatsApp is playing uh, an important role in messages and posts related, for example, also as proposing cures. Um, I think this is not only happening in Mexico. These kind of messages are spreading in other Latin American countries. But what we can see specifically in Mexico are like narratives or comments, especially on TV channels, suggesting that direct, direct Mexico is hiding data or confirmed cases. So there is a narrative behind these arguments saying that there are data inconsistencies from the official public health data in Mexico. So what is happening here? Mexico is using a, a model called Sentinel. In this, this model is used to predict confirmed cases in order to measure or evaluate what you cannot see. For example, you have like right now there are like almost 3,000 3, tests in Mexico. So you only can detect or confirm cases based on this test. And you are not seeing a great part of all the population in Mexico, right? So this model is used in order to measure or evaluate what you cannot see, right? So TV hosts or TV channels, even Twitter accounts are posting that based on this model, government is hiding data or is hiding confirmed cases when actually what is happening behind this model is just a statistical model, right? So I think this kind of narrative have lead to misinformation because people maybe don't, don't understand all the statistical mold behind this, this specific strategy from the government. And they are spreading more or accumulate more volume of tweets or Facebook posts or messages on WhatsApp saying that in, indeed Mexico government is hiding these kind of confirmed cases what is actually the other way around, right? It's just a measure to try to understand what is happening in those cases that you cannot see already. Um, and also I think some of the more recent narratives are around public forces in different states in Mexico, like Jalisco, like mm -hmm. using in mechanisms based on, on force in order to encourage the, in some way, staying home or prevent the mobility in the city, right? So there are also some kind of narratives saying that in this case, the uh, public forces are beyond the alternatives in order to pressure citizens to stay at home. So I think this is an important part because in a moment, in, in these moments of crisis, and when you tend to, to lead others to enter in panic because you don't know how to respond in these scenarios, the use of force by the, by the police, I don't think is the best way to conduct this kind of measure, right? right. Marco also, and Safe. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, I'm glad that you brought up sort of the federal versus local reactions. And I'd like to actually pivot to Marco and Dr. Safe Savage as well to comment on specifically um, Brazil and Mexico both are, are countries that are still battling high rates of inequality and economies are definitely forecasted to take a hit uh, all over the world, not just in Latin America, but um, in Mexico and Brazil, I wanted to ask you how this reality has impacted how the administrations shape their narratives and specifically how 
are societies in Brazil and Mexico approaching federal versus local guidance on COVID-19? How are we seeing narratives connecting to how people are reacting at the federal and local level? And um, Marco, I'll start with you on that. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Roberta and Atlantic Council. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I, I'd like to put in a larger perspective what's going on here. In a certain sense, it makes, it makes a link with what's going on in the world. I mean, uh, we have, a, first here, we have a problem for the, the federal government has a, has a, a, a continuous tension in, uh, I would say, in a horizontal, horizontal level with other powers and, and affecting the check and balance. And they are trying to, to affect, in a certain sense, the check and balance between the judiciary, the legislative and executive powers. So I would bet uh, that there's some kind of intention from the federal government right now. And this is coming since the election we had, which was very polarized. polarized. Uh, to try to get a kind of um, uh, unitary executive power. So it's, it's, it's something that it's here. It's not ex explicit, but it's here. So there's a huge clash between the powers in the check and balance system. On the, on the federal level and in, in the federalist uh, 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 arrangement that we have, governors, with the start of the pan pandemics, they start to, to do a, their job and not, and, and not uh, underestimate the pandemics and start to, since the federal government was not doing uh, a lot three, three, three months ago, when we all knew that what's going to happen in all over the world, including Brazil, they start to, 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 to take measures and concrete actions. And that uh, makes the bring some some anger from the federal government, especially the executive branch, that uh, try to diminish the, the the crisis and say, "Oh, this is just a, just a common flu or things like that," which, which really doesn't make sense. It's a total nonsense because at that time we had a lot of data ready, and. Um, so this is the tension that we have in that, that the coronavirus crisis brings uh, more in the surface of the political process in Brazil. But actually the coronavirus brought other things. For example, the discussion about the size of the state, the importance of the state, the importance of the federalism, the importance of democracy and how social networks can enhance uh, 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 different narratives in the process, how this information is affecting the process. And overall, and then I, I can put this in a re real large perspective, is a challenge that democracy in many different countries, including the US, is facing right now in the opening of the 21st century. I would say that the, the epidemics, in a certain sense, uh, starts the, the, the 21st century because we are now are facing choices and questions that uh, will, will shape the political debate for the next years. So it's a very tense situation here in Brazil, and uh, the coronavirus brings together in Brazil a huge political crisis. So, so, so the, 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 we just watched last week the fall of the second minister. The first one for, was the health minister, which was totally contrary about the, 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 the ideas of our president. And now we, we lost last week the, 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 the minister of justice. So we have two crises together at the same time working and disrupting overall confidence of the citizens in the system. But actually what's working is the traditional health system, public health system that is in some, some ways 
manage the crisis and try to to establish uh, a logical approach for the for for the situation. And safe. What about in Mexico? How are we seeing sort of disinformation impacting how people are reacting? Um, how narratives are being shaped at the federal and the local level? Are similar things happening in Mexico that we've seen happening in Brazil? So. Um, I would argue that one thing to consider is that the main narrative that the government of Mexico has in this current pandemic is uh, treating citizens as if they were children. And so they created, for instance, a cartoon character called uh, Susana Distancia, which is a cartoon character that is explaining to citizens how they can keep safe, how to keep social distance. They also created uh, TV shows that are shown four times a day that are explaining in detail what is going on with the pandemic, you as a citizen, what you can do to keep safe. They're repeating the information over and over and over again so that it's extremely clear to citizens what is going on. But they're being treated as children. And this, I, I view it actually as a really brilliant strategy. Um, on one hand, you have to consider that in Mexico, we are accustomed to being treated by children, by authority. Uh, so when the Spanish arrived, they saw the indigenous populations as children who they needed to educate. So unlike the British who uh, saw, the, saw the native uh, people as uh, folks that didn't have any redemption and murdered them, the Spanish saw them as children that needed education. And so we have a long history of being accustomed to being treated as children. So this is not something that is out of, um, that is out of context for us. And uh, I see it as a brilliant strategy because if the citizen is a child, you're no longer scared. You trust your parent, the government, to tell you what to do. You just have to follow those orders. And I would argue that this strategy of treating the citizens as children has been effective in reducing the panic and getting citizens to follow orders uh, because it suddenly becomes very clear what is going on. We have four times a day a TV, uh, government TV shows that are explaining in detail what is going on. Um, and so this is the main strategy that the government is doing where they are, the information is presented extremely clear to citizens. And say, so if I wanted to follow up on that, um, to ask you, and it's something that I'll ask the others as well, um, how polarization has affected conversations and reactions to COVID. Um, in Mexico's case, have we seen conversations play out um, online in any specific ways? What are some of the trends that you're seeing online right now? Yes, uh, so uh, I'm actually gonna share a screen about uh, this analysis that I have been doing. Um, so on one hand, uh, what we are seeing is that uh, a lot of political trolls have emerged who are using uh, the COVID-19 situation to push their agenda and start to showcase like, oh, the government is doing things that are incorrect. And we also have others who are also using the situation to also push their agenda uh, to sometimes even have more power uh, in terms of saying what citizens should and shouldn't be doing. So um, in my lab, uh, we did an analysis about how people were engaging. So um, right now I shared my screen. Um, so. Currently in Mexico, um, two different organizations have emerged that focus on, uh, sorry, let me showcase my, uh, can you guys see my screen? So yes. in Mexico, uh, two organizations have emerged that focus on presenting, on fighting disinformation online. And so given that right now we have a lot of polarization, we were very interested in understanding how effective are these organizations at fighting disinformation? Uh, how are citizens engaging with them? And so we collected all of the tweets that were mentioning these two organizations. Uh, one is called um, COVID MX, and the other one is COVID COVID nineteen uh, EESP Gion uh, COVID nineteen. Um, anyway, we collected all of the tweets that these two organizations were creating, and what we wanted to do was start to understand how are other accounts participating with them. Um, and so we collected over 4,000 tweets. And uh, here in these results, each of these points represents an account that was tweeting about uh, this organization that is sharing news related to disinformation. Um, and so each point represents an account. The y-axis showcases the number of retweets 
about this organization that that particular account received. And the x-axis represents the number of tweets that each of those accounts created. We were interested, my lab was interested in studying, okay, so who are the outliers? Who are the accounts that are engaging the most with uh, the content that these organizations, uh, ESP COVID-19 and COVID-MX are creating? Um, and please check out these uh, accounts as well because they're doing a fantastic job in fighting this information. And so we label the outliers to start to understand who are the people that are engaging the most with these accounts. What was interesting what we, about what we found was that, for instance, we started seeing that uh, one of the accounts that was most engaging was uh, an influencer and reporter who is actually fighting against uh, President Obrador. Um, and so he is a political reporter who is actively creating a lot of news, news reports against uh, Obrador. And so he's using uh, the content that this organization is creating to fight disinformation to justify, uh, to justify and create content against the president. And so I think that it's also important to start to realize that when we're trying to think about, okay, we, we want to fight this information, that information can also be weaponized by political actors and political trolls to further push their agenda, to start to, to pu push uh, whatever uh, conspiracy theories or other stories that they, that they want to showcase. And so in this case, uh, for instance, this reporter is using, is using uh, the information that this organization, COVID-MX, is creating to push his, his agenda about how Obrador is not transparent uh, and political lies allegedly that Obrador is saying. Um, and we also had, for instance, uh, one of these other accounts also described himself in his account as a political troll. And again, they were using that information to further push their agenda, further push conspiracy theories that they had. And so I just want to highlight, because I think that it's important for us to realize that sometimes information used to fight disinformation can be weaponized. Thank you so much, Saif. Um, I know that I'd like to pose this question to Louisa and Marco as well. Um, and we might just exit out of you sharing your screen at this point. Um, but I will direct the conversation, um, Lou, to you first. So you've done also a lot of work tracking different accounts, um, tracking narratives around COVID on on online, on Twitter, on Facebook in Brazil. And so very quickly, I wanted to ask you what, what it is that you've been seeing um, related to polarization in Brazil and how the narratives are spreading. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, everything that is happening now is very connected to polarization. We can see that uh, those that support uh, the president are spreading this type of narrative. So they are saying that the hospitals are empty and downplaying the, the pandemic. And on the other side, you have people um, that are like saying that it's, it's a problem. And what's happening right now is that people are protesting. So because they cannot go out in the street, they are pot banging. Uh, there are protests ever since uh, the beginning of the crisis and the beginning of Bolsonaro's response. Because what happened in Brazil was that uh, Bolsonaro said, as Marco mentioned, he said it was a little flu, he said it was hysteria from the media, and we saw other presidents doing the same, which is actually something that the Mexican uh, colleagues can talk about. We saw that Obrador, for instance, in the beginning, he was also saying, okay, you can go and hug people, uh, hug, if you can go out to have dinner, you can go and have dinner. But then, from what I understand, he changed that approach. The same thing kind of happened to Trump. So Trump, in the beginning, he was saying that it didn't matter, it was nothing really serious, and then he changed all his discourse to say, oh no, actually, I always said it was very complicated. Bolsonaro did not change. Uh, right now, we have some other leaders that are doing the same, such as like in Belarus, uh, Lukashenko is doing the same. And that is uh, causing more polarization in the, in the country than we already had. The country was already super polarized because of the elections. Actually, Brazil has been in a crisis ever since 2014. So this is just increasing polarization. A bit of polarization is good because you have to uh, know uh, what some parties stand for. So uh, I don't want to say that we don't want to have any polarization. But the hyperpolarization that we have in Brazil and that is showing now, it um, uh, harms the response to the crisis. You have people going out to the streets. So I was talking about people that are against Bolsonaro, that are protect protesting from their houses. But you also have people that support Bolsonaro and want to see the country reopening, that are going to the streets in cars 
and protesting, asking for the country to open again. So you can see, and like, I think this is a very, when we talk about elections, it's, it takes a while to see the results. But now in this crisis, it's, uh, the, the response interval is shorter. You can see that um, people are already, like when Bolsonaro says something, uh, you, we have data from states showing that, not we, but like Brazil has data on states showing that people are going more to the streets in states that they voted more for Bolsonaro, supported Bolsonaro more. So you can see that the polarization is having a real effect in the lives of people and the way that Brazil responds to this crisis and that Brazilians respond to this crisis. Marco, I'd like to pivot to you. Um, I know that DAPI has analyzed conversations and mapped out conversations on Twitter specifically, and you've done that work extensively for a while now. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we saw Twitter. Um, we also saw Facebook and YouTube, but we saw Twitter removing some posts that um, showed President Bolsonaro speaking about the efficacy of using hydrochloroquine and encouraging uh, the end of social distancing in exchange for keeping the economy going, um, which for large segments of society in Brazil is also very important. Um, I wanted to ask you why, um, why you think the technology companies made this decision um, and what was the reaction to the takedown uh, in Brazil, also as it relates to what Luisa mentioned around polarization? Oh, in Brazil, it, the, the most interesting thing is that uh, we have polarization since uh, 2013, a very explicit polarization. So you have the left polarizing with the right, and you almost have none in the center. So the, 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 the politicians and the political actors in the center of the political spectrum are not very active in, in social media. And that was a problem that they always have to spread their narratives and their perspectives for in a, in a uh, crescently uh, informational society. So that, 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 that's the point. So, but with coronavirus, for the first time, we watched this polarization broke. So the center appears very, very strong, very, very strong. Uh, and since then, uh, since the beginning of the year, I would say uh, two, since two, two, three months ago, we have been through a situation where the center became so huge and the, and the right was diminishing during the time. So the size of the, the right wing right now, it's very small. And the left came together with, with, with the center. So we have almost 70% against the, 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 the narratives that came from, from the federal government, basically. So, so the extreme right, for the first time, we, we have a situation with uh, three different fields, uh, two of them, really against the, the, the narrative of the federal government about coronavirus is not so, such a crisis, much more important will be uh, keep going, business as usual, so forth. But the point is that when they realize, the right in Brazil realize that they are losing such uh, political space, they just decide to, to create a different narrative. So they try to get away from the, the discourse of the, the, the coronavirus is not so uh, shocking and important and so forth, and said instead that, well, if everybody goes to isolation, then we have a huge economic impact. So given, given that we have a very asymmetrical uh, society in terms of the economics and uh, this cannot be done. This is impossible. This is very crazy. And those who are really pushing in favor of the, of the, uh, the suggestions and, and outlines from the World Health Organization, they are leftists in the end. So they are globalists, they are leftists, and they are just doing this to harm the, the federal government. So it's a really uh, amazing and uh, nonsense uh, uh, 
tentative to try to create a different narrative and a different version of, of, of what is true. So uh, the confidence in the end, it's quite confused. That's, that's the reason why we still have people going to the beach when there's a sunny day, because people have some different informations from different sources. So the, the president says, oh, there's no problem at all. We can use uh, the chloroquine or other things like this, and it will be fine in the end, and it will not be fine. fine. Uh, so that is linked to the, to the, the missile of, of, of the Minister of Justice last week, and points out to a possibility of a third crisis in, crisis in economics. So what we have right now is a crisis inside a crisis, which is inside another crisis. So we have all of them together. And that's really complicated. I would love to try to share some slides with you. I tried before, I, I didn't succeed. I will try it right now. If Actually, can... um, before oh, you do, I wanna pose just one quick question to Esteban and Dr. Safe, and then we'll go back to you. Um, and we'll make sure to like take a look at the slides because I know your data visualization work is amazing. Um, so Esteban, uh, Dr. Savage, I wanted to ask you, um, we've looked a lot at disinformation. We know in this field that sometimes disinformation can have a real world effect on people. And sometimes that can lead um, to loss of life, to real harm. And um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about health workers in Mexico. Um, we've read that health workers are being targeted at times for um, being supposedly contagious. And since March, since last month, uh, we've seen over 40 workers having been attacked, um, perhaps as a result of those claims. And so could you share with us uh, what you're seeing as far as which actors are spreading this type of information um, through which platforms and how is it leading to, to these actions being taken against health workers in Mexico? Yeah. Esteban, I'll start. Sorry, Dr. Zaif, go ahead. Oh, th thank you. Um, so that, that's a great question. So uh, I did an initial analysis to understand, well, what type of convert, who is recruiting people and radicalizing them basically to start attacking healthcare workers? One of the things that uh, we started finding in my lab was that we couldn't find any traces on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter about people actively organizing to start attacking healthcare workers. This was surprising to us because in the past, for instance, we have been able to trace uh, people who are organizing uh, to report, uh, for instance, police officers who are trying to take them down uh, because they're they're measuring uh, alcohol level on people. Um, we've also been able to track down citizens who are organizing, for instance, protests, et cetera. But right now we weren't able to find them directly on social media. And so what this said to us was that they were likely organizing on private channels on, for instance, WhatsApp. And that is why that is very dangerous. Uh, if they're organizing on WhatsApp, we have no idea about how to reach them. We don't know what keywords to use. We don't know what they're saying, who is recruiting them, how are they being radicalized to the point of becoming violent to healthcare workers. Um, and so, and the thing is that we don't know where these groups are exactly. And so that's why those private channels become very dangerous. And I think that what the federal government did was actually a, a good uh, reaction to to, to this problem, because what they did was that they went nationally on, and uh, within their uh, four times a day TV shows, they brought in the healthcare workers that were being attacked and they talked about the problem. Now, talking nationally about it, I think was one of the only solutions because if we don't know where those groups are talking, we can't reach them to intervene and stop them. And so I think that what the president did about going and talking publicly about the problem highlighting it was a good solution for that type of disinformation because currently we don't know where these conversations are happening or how we can intervene to stop them. Simone, I want to pivot to you to add to that, but also perhaps to add a, what it is that you've been seeing regarding sort of news consumption in Mexico. So where do people get their information um, and how is that related to how disinformation has been spreading and through which channels? Yes, for example, I, I think what Saiz 
as I say, is very important because that shows uh, some of the most important challenges to combat disinformation, especially in Mexico. If you try to identify networks or how this information is spread on Twitter, even on Facebook, it's kind of easy to track these accounts or these narratives. On WhatsApp, it's very difficult if these kind of messages and these attacks to health workers are through WhatsApp. You don't have the idea how to, to research these kind of networks, right? But, but I think Mexico, and something important to contextualize is that Mexico, for Mexico, Twitter and Facebook are the are those social platforms widely used in compared to maybe other countries in Latin America. Right? Some estimations suggest that almost 10 million Twitter accounts exist in Mexico and more than 80 million Facebook profiles exist in Mexico. So this indicates the importance of the impact that some narratives could have in the Mexica, Mexican audience, right? Uh, for them, talking about the polarization that we were talking about, that maybe this is some way that how Mexicans consume information or are looking for some answers related, for example, to COVID-19. Uh, I would like to also share the screen, just to share a, a basic slide. I don't know if you can see here. This We try to monitor and to track all the mentions to the trending topics in the last year. This is, for example, from March 1st, 2018 until April 2020. What we can see here is that there are some peaks on the number of mentions with, top, with some top hashtags as AMLO Renuncia, AMLO Mexico demands you. This is like AMLO, we are, we are with you. AMLO, you are not alone. Um, what we can see is that although you have peaks in 2018 higher than those that we can see in 2020, what we can see that those number of mentions right now amid the COVID-19 crisis are the higher so far in this year. So this is quite important because this show how polarization has been increased in the last couple of months. Uh, this is... Uh, sorry, this is a uh, in this other slide we can see how the trending topics that especially those hashtags even either supporting or in opposition to Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador have increased also in April and this is an incomplete month. I mean this is just until April 20 and we can see that there is more pluralization than in previous months in this year and it's already reaching the number of trending topics that, for example, in November, this is a year after Mexico's President Lopez Obrador took office. So this is a way that we can see how people or Twitter accounts are engaging in, tre in trending topics. This chart on the right shows new, newly created accounts in the, just after, Lopez Obrador pitched the economic plan on April 5. So this is quite important because this was an event after Lopez Obrador received a lot of critics because the economic plan wasn't enough or maybe people understand the economic plan as a, something that will help in the future or in our long term. So we can see that those narratives that are being pushing in just a couple of weeks ago are or seems to be driving by inattentive behavior. This is something that is kind of new because some of the narratives against Lopez Obrador suggest that he's using bots or automated uh, accounts to push narratives supporting him. But we can see here the opposite, right? That we can see also that narratives against him are used by inauthentic behavior. 
Thank you, Esteban. I think seeing the, the narratives mapped out is, is really important. Um, I know we have about only 15 minutes left. I'd still like to talk about the role of media, and I'd also like to talk about what more we can all, as a community, as digital Sherlock's, be doing to counter disinformation uh, during a crisis like this. Um, before I go to Luisa on, on information consumption in Brazil and also the role of media, um, I do want to pass the floor to Marco just for a minute, because Marco, I know DAPI has also mapped out these narratives. Um, and so uh, we do have a few minutes. If you'd like to share your screen, we can take a look at those data visualizations. I'd love to try to share. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see if it works right now. Does it work? Mm, we are seeing just one black screen. I think if you open. Huh. I think it's just that the connection is slow. Yeah, maybe. But why don't you talk through some of the findings that, that you mapped out? How are maybe. we seeing these narratives? Still? Okay. So, uh, well, um, what we, we, we have been following, uh, we, we, we have been downloaded millions of readers. So, so this, is, this is an important. Marco, I'm actually, as you read through this, um, I am going to ask you to stop sharing your screen so we can see you on, on the Zoom again. Thank you. There you go. Go ahead. I'm sorry for that. No, no worries. But anyway, um, well, we are following all, all the process of disinformation and polarization and so forth in these different fields that have been uh, uh, making a, the, the landscape of Twitter and the debate, political debate change. Uh, in the end, what we found, for example, in the last last week, it's very interesting because we still have a kind of a, 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 a engineering for disinformation. That's what we are calling. So we start to, to watch. Oh, by the way, uh, differently from the election, the debate right now, it's much more organic than during the election. The election, we have thousands of bots. Uh, all the time, and right now uh, is, we still have the bots. We, heal, we still have a lot of disinformation going on, but it's not so strong as it was in the past. And in in our opinion, is it because people are so having such a tremendous momentum? Almost five each five year five days, we have a different crisis and a different crisis and a different. It's so such a small, so compressed time that there's no no, no people just organically uh, uh, participate. But uh, in the last week, what we saw was an engineering of the information. So it starts with some people putting some ideas, and I'm talking basically about about the right here, the right the, the, the right supporters, uh, um, and then we we watch the bots spreading these ideas and then we we watch the, the official discourse in governments uh repeating the same arguments over and over so it's a, it's an engineering because if you can put it in a longitudinal analysis we saw that it started in the it all everything stuck in the web and and goes to the real world so this is quite interesting it's not the other way other way around uh as a footnote i would like to say that yes you can track uh the discussion in whatsapp i think whatsapp must be really bring to attention about the harm about the lack of 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 policies in the whatsapp what the harm it's 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 provoking in democratic society because it, yes it, it's true uh, safe said that and I, it's correct it's difficult to 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 understand and, and to analyze like we do in with twitter but still can do it and we have been doing that and the way to do that is because you have uh, whatsapp public groups so you can enter on it uh, there's a lot of discussions and in the end, you'll be invited to a different kind of, you were really invited to a different uh, uh, WhatsApp group. And from there, you're going to be invited to another one. 
and another one, and each one is more specific. And in the end, you can really find the ideas they are trying to share about uh, among their supporters. So these ideas create the, 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 the scope about these ideas will be reproduced in the Twitter after that. So we are, we are starting to try to measure this more in qualitative analysis than quantitative, quantitative ones, but still we can do it. It's, it's hard, but we can do it. And I think it's very important because WhatsApp must be more accountable about what they are providing uh, in terms of the instruments that in the end can be used to harm democratic society and democratic process. So uh, I think it's a great instrument, but it needs policy and they just don't do, don't create policy for that. I think this is actually a good segue um, to talk about efforts that different different industries, uh, different actors are, are taking to counter disinformation. So um, Louise, I'd like to really quickly pivot to you. Um, I do still wanna talk about information consumption and the role of media. Um, so maybe you can start us off with letting us know maybe where different segments of Brazilian society might be getting their information from about COVID, um, how that affects sort of trust and distrust in media, and then what are media and other actors, including technology companies, doing to counter disinformation about the, the spread of the virus. So let me try to connect this to what we were discussing before too. Um, I think one thing that maybe we have to, to talk about, uh, especially because we have people that are not Brazilian and comparing the situation to Mexico, it's like, for instance, WhatsApp. Uh, in Brazil, you have these large groups uh, that usually people share the links online, and then it's not a group that is with your family. It's a group of supporters of Bolsonaro, for instance. And then that's what Marco was talking about. You can go and see inside. Um, one of the problems with that is that uh, we don't know exactly what's the the, um, the size, uh, how representative is the sample, because we don't know exactly the, num the exact number of WhatsApp groups that exist in Brazil or in the world. Um, WhatsApp did take some measures. So for instance, one of the big discussions in Brazil uh, during the elections uh, around WhatsApp and how they are functioning as a vector for the spread of this information, it's about the way that the, uh, WhatsApp is designed. Uh, so if you think about Twitter, if you think about Facebook, those are like uh, a public square where people go and talk while WhatsApp's like being in your house, you're talking to, to someone there and it's more difficult to track. So we're able to join these groups that have public links shared on the internet, but I'm not able to share the group that you, Roberta, have with your family. And it's uh, what we know is that uh, information circulates there from these groups. WhatsApp is a closed space, but it's not entirely closed in the sense that what Marco was saying, we see things from, that start on WhatsApp and get to the government. We see, see things that are in Twitter and WhatsApp at the same time. So WhatsApp now, uh, what they are doing is that so they reduce the amount of times that you can forward the message and things like that. Uh, it's difficult still to investigate and to know the impact because, as I said before, we don't have the data to check if that had an impact or not. Uh, during the elections, right before the elections in Brazil, they did a similar move and according to them, it had an effect. It's hard for us to know. Um, but what's happening in Brazil, so there's a situation that um, you have something that the information is being shared in all these channels. Uh, there is an increase in trust right now with the COVID crisis. People are looking more for uh, traditional media. So the, the newspapers in Brazil, the legacy media is saying that they are having a higher audience. But still, we know that many people get informed through WhatsApp and through other social media channels. And what happens in Brazil, in Brazil is that it appears to be uh, it, we still already had the same thing in 2018 during the elections. Now it looks to me that it's more organized and we don't know, like with open, open source data, this is what the DFR lab does. It's difficult to know what exactly is happening, who, who is behind this strategy. Now in Brazil, there are some investigations uh, that are trying to understand whether the government is behind that or has a relationship to this uh, what, call, what Marco called an uh, engineer, I call this information architecture. So there are, invest this is being investigated. Uh, people want to understand whether there are, uh, even the family of the president is involved with that. And so this is what we're trying to understand now. Uh, 
how much is the government involved, how much of this is misinformation, how much is disinformation, and what is the impact that that can have. Uh, we have fact checkers that are doing an amazing job in Brazil, but what I see, and I think it's very important that we have everything connected. So you have now fact checkers that are saying, okay, this is not true. You have people that are investigating with open source data uh, what's happening, what are the trends, and how this is happening, so who is amplifying, etc. But we also need that, so we need actually, in Brazil right now, it's a police case, you need the police investigating who is behind it. And I think all those efforts coming together are going to be important for the future of this discussion in the country. Thank you, Lou. I know we are almost out of time. We have about five more minutes. So I do want to pivot to Esteban and Dr. Savage for you to share with us a little bit about what is being done to counter disinformation. And that was also a question we received from the audience is, what sources are there in Mexico and Brazil um, to fact check and counter disinformation? Um, is that information coming out in a readable way, uh, in a transparent way? Um, and what more can tech companies and others um, be doing to counter disinformation in Mexico? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start really quickly on, uh, so what efforts exist in Mexico to fight disinformation? Um, so I briefly talked a little bit about uh, two NGOs that have emerged who are working independent from the government and are doing a lot of fact checking. And they're also helping people to learn about how they can fight disinformation. So they're also doing an effort to teach people digital skills. One of them is COVID-19 and in, in Espanol, and the other one is COVID-MX. Uh, they have different approaches, and so it's also interesting to understand the different ways that they're operating. From what I understand, COVID-19 and in, in Espanol is very much focused on translating a lot of the information that exists in English to Spanish so that uh, audiences in the whole Latin America can, under, can fight this information because they have better digital skills. And uh, they're also giving them tools to, to explain the, echo, the infodemic that we're involved in. Um, and so that is what uh, COVID-19 and Espanol, I believe, is, is doing. And they've been doing a fantastic job in engaging audiences in Latinos in the US. And they also have even uh, some government officials who have tweeted about them. And so that has given them support um, in engaging more, uh, more audiences. COVID COVID-MX uh, is an organization that has focused on doing a lot of fact checking on news stories that emerge. So uh, for instance, um, one, one uh, a, a, a very famous priest in Mexico uh, gave out a recommendation about how, he, how you can cure COVID-19 by drinking tea. This organization went out and debunked, uh, de debunked the story from the priest that it was incorrect, that you could not be cured this way. And so um, given that this organization is covering current events, the problem is that sometimes political trolls are taking their story as weapons to attack the opposition. So that's also important to consider that sometimes uh, because of the polarization that can exist, this, these fact checking tools are used by others to start to create political attacks. Um, but both of these organizations are doing really good efforts. Um, another interesting thing that COVID-19 uh, MX is doing um, is that it's working very independent from the government. And I think that here in these, these cases, it's important to have independence because uh, that also makes you more trustworthy. It, it doesn't appear as if you're backing anybody up. And so I think that COVID, COVID MX has also done a great job in uh, showcasing that they're independent. It's uh, formed by a group of journalists who also did Verificado 19S, which was, uh, they, they basically did a fact checking for the, for the presidential election in Mexico mm -hmm. that happened. So they have a lot of experience, but I recommend people check out uh, COVID-19 in Espanol and also COVID MX. They are doing fantastic jobs in fighting disinformation in the area. In the Great. Thank you so much. Um, we actually at the DFR lab uh, and the Adrian Arch Latin America Center had the privilege of working with uh, Anima Politico and Verificado around the elections um, to help in sort of explaining what was going on. Um, I know we have one minute left, um, and this is also another question that came in from the audience. It's about the resources, um, where can we all go um, to contribute to the countering of the disinformation as a, as a society, as digital Sherlock's? What are some resources out there? Um, I'm going to pose 
this question to all of you, but I'll start with Esteban. Um, Esteban, uh, it, what do you have to add um, about what more we can be doing in Mexico? Yeah, I think the data transparency has been one of the main challenges in Mexico. I mean, they are public health data is still delivering the information through PDF. So it's not quite open source or open data if we try to analyze this amount of data. So what, but what it shows though is that some there are civil society trying to open these data sets and create open source on some of the ways you can find this, for example, on, on GitHub, there is some pages or some organization dedicated to open these data sets from PDF to uh, uh, some more readable formats, formats like CSV or Excel. Um, this is, I think this is great because it can, it shows how strength or how interesting is civil society in Mexico to counter this information or act at least try to get or to provide better mechanisms from open data, right? And just another one point I think is interesting to add is that in order to create better mechanisms to counter this information, research or creating labs last, like digital search laws or the SI format, I think this is one of the main steps to create some of the better tools for society in order to counter this information. And I think in this step, it's very important that the government could be involved in order to create better mechanisms to finance or fund this kind of research. In Mexico right now, in the next months, the, the new law from science and technology will be discussed. So I think this is some of the components that this law needs to add. How can we, or how can Mexico improve research in order to improve digital resources or digital research in Mexico. Thank you, Esteban. I know we are actually over time, so unfortunately I won't have any more time to ask questions, but what I'll say is um, if you follow us on social media, we'll make sure to share some more resources and resources from our partners at FGV, um, at UNAM University and others. Um, there are a lot of people doing this work uh, and that's why it's so wonderful that we have a community of digital Sherlocks from all over the world sharing lessons learned, uh, tactics and strategies on this. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers so much for joining us today. Mah Kusev, Esteban and Luisa, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, and to our audience, thank you for joining us and make sure to stay tuned in for additional articles, research outputs and strategies for countering this information from the DFR Lab uh, and the Atlantic Council. Thank you all so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.